Mental Health Mondays. Yes, I know it's Tuesday. Work with me here. So many of you follow Young to Live by, and as such, you'll know that they just dropped a six and a half hour long video about the anima and the animus and the importance of relating. I'm about two hours in, and I think this is phenomenal stuff. I'm piggybacking here today a little bit, although you don't need to have seen that video for this to hopefully uh, speak to you. So where essentially Stephen Pauline over on that channel, link in the description, give you these 10, 10 course feasts. I'm more like a weekly power bar. So I just wanted to add some thoughts here. It's great stuff. Check it out. But right here, I wanted to talk a bit more on the origin and importance of relating. The anima and the animus as a function is about ultimately relating. It's very important not to reify these things and get caught up in fantasies about what the anima and the animus are supposed to look like, da 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 da. Those are just images and representations. The function of the anima and the animus is to draw you out of your comfort zone, out of your shell, out of your safe space to explore new possibilities. It is fraught with allure and danger all at once. Now, this is why this function is imagined as a sexually charged other. It, however, is innate. It's full of conflict and potential, but it's also about balancing yourself as well as defining yourself. So, for example, if you look at many young men today, what I see, generally speaking, culturally is, in our society anyway, men seem to be pulled into maladaptive directions. On one end, they're, they are pulled in the direction of being basically narcissistic bullies. Or on the other end, they're being pulled into being passive and inert, essentially. There's no balance here. The anima function within a person is trying to pull a person out of this, either of these two extremes, by balancing them out, right? Balancing out the hyper-masculine on one end and the hypo-masculine on the other. But, you know, you might ask, well, what does that mean, really? Essentially, it means, I think, following the compass provided by the genome that would lead you to optimal adaptation. In my opinion, and this is just my opinion, but it is based on a lot of the stuff that I've been looking at over the years. I think biologically, men are pressured from the genome to be protectors, providers, and strengtheners. Those are the three biggies. And I'm going to talk more about that in a future video. But for now, just realize that I think these features are there, not just because of my political opinions or any of that stuff. I think this, you can, you can show this from a study of our rather unique history as organisms that have collective living, shared parenting, offspring investing uh, features, and very, very essentially social primates. So I think this, this niche that we have, that we have evolved into, will, I think, give immense satisfaction and meaning to a young man who pursues this balancing act here following as it has evolved in Homo sapiens, as opposed to say tigers or bears, which don't have any fathering. In humans, we do, we have a significant amount of fathering. And in cross cultural examinations of how fathering behavior tends to be carried out, it's usually focused on encouraging, teaching rules and discipline and fostering resilience, i.e. emotional regulation, which I think a lot of that can be boiled down to the strengthening element that I mentioned earlier. Typically, mothering is geared more towards mirroring, nurturing, and comforting. Now, these are just general tendencies. And the reason why there's a specialization here is because of the immense need that our offspring have compared to other animals. Both genders can, of course, do all of this. And there, but there's usually a division of labor there because, again, the needs are so great. Can there be super parents out there that can do all of it? Of course, but it, there is a cost to doing that because it was not the environment of adaptation that developed these tendencies. I'll get into that a little bit here, but I wanted to talk more about this relating function and how it's talked about a lot in psychology. Many schools of psychology connect one's ability to relate to others to, quote, the mother, unquote, 
pop Jungian psychology kind of misuses this idea and has reified the mother into this sort of mythological character that gets projected onto one's mother. It, it's easy to get lost in, in a lot of that stuff. I, I think Jung was correct about how this operates. Uh, Stephen Pauline talked about it being a platonic form. I think that's probably true too. Uh, that's, and that's very consilient with my own approach, but that's really the best case scenario. Uh, other psychologies blame mom for virtually everything because because they don't even recognize the evolved genomic and structural forces at work. And, or, and or, they ignore the toxic cultural problems like hyper-individualism, excessive focus on achievement, devaluing of femininity and women in general, all of that kind of stuff. And what this winds up being is, well, if you have a hard time relating to other people, it must be something you learned from your mother. This is completely unfair. Yes, it is true, mothers, some mothers and fathers can be toxic, but we really need to look beyond the nuclear family into the wider culture and recognize that the mother and child dyad is not actually what the genome sets us up for. If you look at ancient hominins, they, it wasn't just a, a mother and child roaming the wilderness alone, like tigers say, or bears, right? Two of my favorite ones uh, to give examples of because their child rearing techniques and adaptations are very different from ours but we tend to miss this probably because we just take it for granted for homo sapiens it's not a me and mom it's a me and we it's a me and my tribe mom is there mom is super important but there's all these other people that should be there helping to to raise me why why might that be do you think this is something called alloparenting and it is absolutely critical for any understanding of evolution of homo sapiens. Alloparenting is actually a pretty rare feature in the animal world. What do I mean by alloparenting? I mean, the mother gives birth to an offspring and other, other conspecifics of that species come in to help raise the offspring. The humans do this to an ex a very extreme degree compared to other animals. And in fact, there have been many compelling arguments that I've seen, such as the grandmother hypothesis and the grandfather hypothesis, both, you can look those up, that say that because of this, we are the way that we are. In other words, it was only through this adaptation, this alloparenting adaptation, meaning shared caretaking of offspring from extended family uh, and community, that made it even possible for us to develop the level of social intelligence that we have, the language ability that we have, our extended developmental period and, and longevity even compared to other animals, we live quite a long time. Um, that these things are what made, that alloparenting is, is what made those things possible in our species. So what does that mean, do you think? I think it means that children are not adapted to be able to have all their needs met by one person and yet this is what we expect in our culture if it is attempted it, it is possible through sheer force of will we do have free will that you can do it of course and these are heroic efforts and they should be applauded but we also need to recognize that that is putting an undue strain on that caretaker that nature never intended welcome to modern society so my question for you then is what are you going to do about it? How do you think your own encounters with relatedness is focused on more than just your encounters with your own physical mother? Because at the end of the day, we come into the world and our genome is set up for alloparenting. We're not just looking for one caretaker. We want many caretakers. We have a slot for mom, and one for dad, and one for these other folks, the grandparents, the aunts and uncles, the siblings. This is the norm in the hunter-gatherer societies. This is the norm in ancient hominin societies. This is norm in Paleolithic, Paleolithic settings, but it's not the norm in modern society. So that's what I got for you today on Mental Health Monday. Click the like if you enjoyed this. Subscribe. Go to ericgoodman.com. Sign up on my newsletter. You won't regret it. I've got some cool stuff there for you. And that's what I got for you later on.